Hi guys, my name's Subtutor, I'm the man on the Silver Mountain, and welcome back to Subnautica. Now, we're on to the last part of our taking a look at the, the various entries and things, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the indigenous life forms first, because in regards to the equipment, like most of this equipment, we could maybe take a look at. Some of it will be interesting, maybe, but at the same time, we can kind of see what the, the equipment does. So I'm not going to touch on the equipment so much, I don't think. Anything useful? No. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the life forms. Mostly the fauna, because for the most part, I've not, as you can see, scanned much of the, the flora side of things, which may very well be to our detriment, considering we're still looking for, I think it's the ever-elusive sea crown for the... Um, the hatching enzymes but uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll take a look at these after but obviously we've got so many more creatures that were interesting to look at including the ones that are dead and fossilized uh, so we'll we'll take a look at all of these as we go but we'll start with the carnivores at the top so we've got the ampule which is the big one with the the uh, the, the kind of segmented body with electricity coming off it um, a large inquisitive predator found inhabiting the deep waters of the reefs and bulb bush colonies. Strong and territorial, torso mounted prongs appear capable of generating a powerful electric current. Amp eel has been recorded using electricity to incapacitate its prey. It's a faster, stronger and hungrier predator. Oh, if a faster, stronger and hungrier predator lives on the reefs, it appears to avoid the amp eel, probably due to its electric potential. But the the thing that stands out again is we're 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 seeing creatures here with a a kind of electrochemical um, kind of focus on their biology to one extent or another where they are they are consciously in control in some way of some kind of field be it through or well, in this case it's a field um, in the case of of some of the others that we'll look at in a minute it's a field in the case of some of the others it's internal biology and then of course we've got the the sea emperor who we haven't really been able to get a proper scan of a, a living one because the the sea emperor adult is uh, at least the last time we were down there unscannable so um you know maybe that will change in the future but for the most part the the sea emperor scans will have to wait until we've hatched the the eggs there um but again, kind of, it's it's telepathic, which over distance before we even met it, it was jumping into our head, which suggests some kind of ability to influence our neuro uh, kind of neurochemical reactions and things. So there's 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 a, something on this planet that that has helped create that, helped cause that to evolve. But anyway, bone shark powerful predator that lives in small groups and fiercely defends its hunting grounds. Thick armored exoskeleton suggests defensive adaptation either to larger predators or in species aggression. Probably a bit of both, but more likely the fact that they are sat right next to where there are reaper leviathans and things for the most part. Large eyeballs consistent with high light sensitivity likely for hunting of luminescent prey in low light environments which again you see some of um, but there are also a lot of like spade fish don't have any bioluminescent element to them but there are an awful lot of those around where these guys are unless these guys at one point um, kind of evolved in that way because they preyed on the the predecessors to the the jelly rays who are entirely bioluminescent um, generally slow and unresponsive they will act with uncompromising aggression against any threat to their territory, including, if you remember correctly, floating through thin air, uh, completely out of water, because they're arseholes. Um, okay, so crab squid. This large predator can be found in deep waters where it lurks among the blood kelp and membrane trees in search of prey. Ten limbs feature different appendages for swimming, walking, and offensive behavior. Feeds on small fish, which are identified in the murky waters through a combination of smell and light sensitivity which is interesting but, se but hey um, attraction to light sources suggest jelly rays and spine fish may be among its natural prey aggressive when approached now there's no mention here of the fact that it can create an electromagnetic pulse in and of itself which again if the 
if it's um, identifying creatures through high sen highly sensitive smell and light sensitivity, then what caused it to generate, you know, to, to, to evolve to a point where it could unleash electromagnetic pulses? Um, you know, it's like we've, we've, we've got... It, it's not sensing creatures through the sand like a hammerhead shark would with, with its um, kind of magnetic... Not magnetic. Um, kind of the, 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 where it's picking up static electricity from the, the individuals that are moving... Um, it, it's not doing it like that. So then what caused it to evolve? And there's a thing in my head that says, well, we know that the Kara causes mutation, but in a lot of cases it causes mutation to such an uncontrollable extent that it just wipes, it just kills the, the host. So what if some of these creatures that we're seeing on this planet that have potentially been exposed to the Kara for an awfully long time and who have also been deprived of the the Emperor's enzymes in any significant amount to, to combat the Kara. What if they you know, what if these creatures evolved this way as a response to a mix of Kara and influence from the um the precursors? Because they would they they've had they have technology that that uses um, electrical power to one extent or another so potentially the the crab squids and some of these other creatures are that are displaying this um, capacity for creating these these various fields or with these these odd internal biologies um, that are far more pronounced than you would expect a, a normal creature to have because again we've we've got electric eels that deal a fair amount of of electrical pulse and we've got a fair, fair number of other creatures that are bioluminescent or that are um, kind of in one way or another sensitive to, to static and magnetism and all those kind of things but we don't have one like this guy who can knock out an entire submarine with an electromagnetic pulse yeah we don't have telepathic creatures or creatures that can mind control you to the same extent that the next uh, one is so it's 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 an interesting set of ideas there but here we've got the miserable bastard himself uh, the mesmer small carnivorous life form with a unique hunting mechanism that enables it to hypnotize its foes which I've talked about how this is odd before assessment draw closer no okay um, so apparently it's even capable of messing with the the camera on, on or the scanning unit so outer wings the mesmer swims using a number of wings which can be angled up and forwards on approaching its prey tiny lenses on the surface can be tilted independently to create mesmerizing patterns which flood the victim's brain with enticing messages delivered in whatever form is most convincing to the target outer shell the mesmer can open the jaw like recess in its protective outer shell in order to error 463 share its beauty do not resist assessment draw closer so apparently this thing has the capacity to not just confuse us and other creatures because we do see it drawing in other creatures as well but also it has the capacity to mess with whatever kind of virtual intelligence is in our our PDA and, th and scanner, which again, to an extent, suggests to me that maybe these creatures, ha you know, have evolved or ha through the Kara and through integration with um, elements of precursor tech and biology that were left around and potentially picked up by the Kara, because. You know, to, to, to even jump into our scanner and make our scanner have a moment, have our PDA have a moment, um, that's significant. Yeah, it's it's not because we 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 see, we can resist it. We seemingly as soon as we get back into our submarine, it loses interest with uh, in 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 regards to us and all that kind of thing. So it's it's obviously got a, a limit to what it can do and can't do. So. As there isn't one here with us now, this one's been. This one has interacted with 
the, the scanner with the PDA and has caused this corruption in the data. And for just a normal little fish to do that, to actually impress very specific thoughts, as it were, very specific messages into an electronic me an electronic device, you know, that's a considerably powerful little creature. And when we get back to Altera, if, if we come back and we can catch some of them, and then learning from them will be incredibly useful for, uh, you know, making our way onto the board of directors. Um, a fast, agile predator discovered at great depths, the river prowler, Powerful jaws used for both savaging prey and warding off large predators. Its torso, excuse me, is highly vulnerable, uh, consisting predominantly of spinal column and cartilage. It will aggressively keep its jaws facing its opponent, but smaller, faster life forms may have the advantage. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I mean, so far these guys—they've—they've they've kind of come up and snarled at us, but they've not really done anything to us. So, um, you know, they've, they've, they're have they not as, as terrifying as they could be, but yeah, it is wise to avoid them. Sand Shark, these guys are assholes. But again, I feel like these guys are in some way related to the, the Leviathans uh, to an extent, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, a powerful, a slow, powerful predator that digs burrows in the sand and ambushes its prey from below. Uh, number one, the forward dorsal fin, which is this thing on its head there. Uh, the usual, unusual location of its fin suggests a purpose unrelated to movement through the water. It may be employed in shifting sand beneath the surface, or in mating rituals, or may simply be an evolutionary dead end. Now, again, we've we've got a four-eyed creature with like a long body and two kind of tail, well, not tails, fins rather with a lot of teeth and this big fin on its head. And so we've we've got that in the 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 Reaper Leviathans as well to an extent. And they do whilst these guys are, are slightly close to the, the safe shallows, they are also in a fair number of the areas where you find like the dunes where you'd find uh, uh, Reaper. A segmented exoskeleton. Thick armor plating on the organism's back renders it relatively unmaneuverable but also immune to attack from above. Now, in regards to its exoskeleton, we've got another another uh, Leviathan class creature that has an exoskeleton, um, and that's the the sea dragon to an extent, where it's had the build up of um, kind of mineral rich materials into its its uh, chest cavity, especially so that it can act, it can consume um, lava and survive high temperatures. So again, there's a there's an element of that in here as well. Feet, ill-designed for ambulation, likely used to disturb the surface of sand so the life form can burrow in the ground. Now these these things are the things that we've not really seen, but we've got what twelve of them, and so with that we do have other creatures, as with the sea emperor and the sea dragon, that have. Um, uh, a lot of tentacles, but also if you look at the the uh, ghost leviathan, uh, which unfortunately we don't have scans of any of the leviathans yet. That's something that we'll get onto once we've uh, we've not got as much to lose, um, I feel. But uh, with the the ghost um, leviathan in particular, it does have a lot of appendages appendages coming off down its sides, so. But it preys on herbivores up to twice its size. Be vigilant for ambush in sandy biomes. In which case, yeah. So, but attacking herbivores twice its size. I mean, the only one that I can think of that that would really fit in the areas that this guy tends to be in is that things like the gasopods, uh, really, because uh, everything else that's herbivorous tends to be on the smaller side where the where this guy is otherwise. So, but. You know, obviously, even if this guy is related to the various Leviathans in some way as part of their kind of evolutionary tree, um, we got saved by a Reaper Leviathan at one point when it came and chomped on one of these guys. So, you know, there's obviously no love lost there. Um, Stalker, a streamlined predator encountered in the kelp forests in wait of 
prey leaving the safety of the shallows. The stalker's most unusual characteristics is its, attract is its attraction to titanium deposits. Its behavior tends to put stress on its teeth, which are prone to being dislodged and fall to the sea floor. This habit may be a natural method of sharpening its teeth. And that's, a, that's an interesting one. Because it's, it's, we've got, with the, the teeth, yes, they're a high so high, highly rich source of enamel and all the rest of it. But also, these guys tend to be, well, they seem to be very much a kind of outlier from a lot of the other creatures that we see due to their long snout and the, um, the, the kind of shape of their body, the number of fins and things that they've got, the weird kind of back-edged um, element to their fins. Because it seems like they, the, the back of their fin is where the structure is, where it's uh, like either cartilage or, or just more solid tissue, and then that's just a flap of skin. So that's that's kind of weird and interesting. We'll get onto that in a minute. But the fact that they are drawn to titanium deposits specifically, uh, like you would have thought that any piece of coral or rock or, or anything else would do, but they're specifically drawn to titanium, which is why we see them picking up um, the titanium sheets, the scrap metal from the, the various wrecks. But anyway, the teeth. The stalker's teeth are unusually hard and fast growing. Its elongated snout can deliver a huge biting pressure to large attackers, which, uh, or, uh, while also being used to reach small herbivores seeking refuge among the rocks. Uh, retinal layering on the eyeball suggests adaptation for nighttime hunting, which, to be fair, we see them all the time and they're usually hunting all the time anyway, so that's, that's neither here nor there, that bit. Uh, dorsal ridges. These ridges can be moved independently to deliver superior maneuverability, which, again, if this is tissue as opposed to and, and muscle in a, as opposed to cartilage or something like that with this this kind of fin here then yeah you can see that they would be able to turn more but again it's it's like i don't know it's still an odd design for for what it is because you wouldn't you would have thought that maybe it would be more worthwhile having it the other way around so you have a more kind of hydrodynamic um shape to it instead of this weird kind of flat bit and then a lump yeah so the water's just going to go over the flat bit and then hit the lump and that might actually increase resistance i would have thought but hey ho um pelvic fins which are the little ones down here um long and powerful uh the stalker has evolved to hunt even the fastest of prey so i'm guessing it means these ones as well rather than those ones because i would have thought those would be the pelvic fins but maybe that's the catch-all term, and I'm misinformed. I don't know. Either way, doesn't matter. But yeah, so they've. But, but again, like, I feel like these guys stand out as just odd from a lot of these other creatures that we're coming across because we're seeing a lot more kind of points of commonality, even between like the bone shark here and and some of these others where they've they've got kind of a very specific body shape like again these guys could very well be in some way related to the sea emperor due to the, the the kind of shape of the skull or even related to some of the other larger fossil kind of creatures where with the the exoskeletons and the the large mouths and things whilst the stalkers just kind of sat here out by itself not really seemingly related to many other things so and then we've got these assholes, the warpers, an aggressive creature with the ability to warp itself and others because it's an asshole. Um, head. Mechanisms located in the head region make this life form capable of phase jumping itself and other organisms uh, to different locations. Torso. Appears to hunt other life forms, but no in uh, digestive organs have been identified. Internal structure considerably more complex than other known organisms. No genetic crossover identified with other local life forms demonstrates no recognized defensive behavior. See, now that's the interesting thing. No genetic crossover identified with other local life forms. So, as much as they have been made, they have been built to seemingly be quite reminiscent of the Sea Emperor because they've got the two long front fins, they've got the collection of tentacles at the back, the kind of solid, stocky body, uh, the four eyes, the mandibles, and, and stuff like that. As much as they have been kind of designed to blend in, um, they aren't actually built of anything that's on this planet, which is potentially why they are 
Kara resistant, seemingly, and and so on and so forth, because chances are that they are made from some kind of synthetic genome um, that allows them to then tackle stuff. The interesting thing, though, is that they are able, you know, granted, we've seen them just run away instead of, you know, there's no straight up defensive behavior because they just teleport away. Yeah, they're aggressive all the time, but if they get into trouble, they just vanish. So the thing that's interesting with, with these guys, though, is so the precursors seemingly haven't made any more. And these guys, their little arms there don't seem to be able to make more of themselves. You know, they don't seem to be dexterous enough for that. And yet we still see a fair number of them and they still seem kind of really happy to just roll around but surely some of these guys have been eaten by large critters i mean there's still a chance that if this guy if these guys weren't too severely damaged and were able to get eaten then they would be able to walk out of another creature maybe but uh, again also at the same time it, maybe that's why they were designed to look and appear like indigenous life forms like something like the sea emperor because then they've been left alone it's a, an interesting thing but yeah they're they're odd but yeah so this one uh, i'm not sure which one this one is ancient fossil, fossilized skull right this is the one this is the really big one with the 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 kind of exoskeleton and apparently that's the skull in and of itself so the skull of a million year old armoured carnivore. Projections suggest this life form would have been larger than any living specimen encountered on the planet. The oceans of 4546b must have been very different to support life forms of this size, with more open geography and many more life forms in the Leviathan range, which potentially is what we would see if we went into the deep waters much, much further off the edge. Fluid yes, alright, I'm going to... Vital signs. There we go. Um, but yeah, so so you know it would have had you would have so to support something that big, big. I mean that if that's just its head, then that makes it even bigger than the other huge specimen. So uh, that sat in the beginning at the entrance to the the um, lost river. So you know it's it's kind of massive. So you would have had to have an off a uh, very high oxygen kind of concentration in the waters um an awful lot of food to support something of that size as said open geography and so on and so forth and this planet seems to be kind of tiny considering how quick the days and nights go and how fast the moons move you know this planet seems to be pretty small um but yeah okay so right this is the Skeletal remains of a vast predator housed within an artificial habitat. Okay, I think... I think, yeah, this is the kind of biter leviathan that's that's in the, the collapsed facility. So habitat. The environment constructed to house the specimen suggests it was kept alive in containment for research purposes for months or even years. Organic matter indicates the habitat once supported extensive plant life, though it has since decayed cause of death there is little physical damage to the skeleton suggesting death from malnourishment or outside interference biology while it shares some skeletal traits with the biter this fossilized specimen is significantly larger and features unusual forearms it matches no living specimen encountered so far indicating it has either faced extinction in the past thousand years or evolved beyond recognition which to be fair could either mean the Kara has forced evolution from that species into something else, which is maybe what they were seeing and why they were why they had that specimen in there. Um, or it could very well be a case of it was a spliced um, kind of sea dragon with the, the little arms out front and a biter to try and uh, kind of come up with something that would do the same job as the Sea Emperor, but that was more easy to control for them. Who knows? But right, the sea dragon skeleton, the semi-intact skeletal structure of a Leviathan-class predator. Head trauma. There is clear evidence of massive physical trauma to the head. The damage is so severe it likely caused it's it was the likely likely the cause of death. God damn it, I can't read. And must have occurred somewhere nearby. Damage is consistent with a high-speed collision with a solid object, which was when 
sea dragon mummy here went and headbutted the precursor facility because they went and stole her eggs and it was pissed at them. Um, age. Something in the environment uh, has helped to preserve these remains, but calcium decay suggests an approximate time of death about a thousand years ago. Bone growth suggests the creature was in, an egg in the egg-laying stage of its life cycle. So yeah, it was a mummy to one degree or another. And a thousand years ago, when the precursors lost control and it all went to hell here, um, this creature was the start of it. This creature was the thing that compromised the facility, unleashed the Kara in full force on the rest of the planet, and so on. Potentially, I mean, it doesn't say that, that, that it's the case, but potentially with the head trauma and the damage done to it and the fact that it just lay down and died, um, you know, this, this creature would have, uh, like, had a large dose of the Kara in its system and then other creatures eating it would have then ingested the Kara through the remains of this creature and um, you know they that's that's how they would have contracted the disease from the, the dead corpse of this creature right we need some food just quickly Vital signs stabilizing. there we go right so on to the next one then we've got the sea emperor fetus and this is one of the ones in the cases um in the in the sea emperor facility this feature fetus matches available biological data for the sea emperor leviathan it was likely a child of the adult specimen contained within this facility physiology superficial damage to the specimen suggests uh well indicates it was artificially removed from its egg casing stunted tissue development suggests the organism expired during the removal process tissue samples have been taken from the digestive tract, which again would probably be to work out how to synthesize enzyme, enzyme 42, which, you know, obviously didn't go too well for the precursors. Analysis. It appears the aliens were attempting to formulate a cure for the bacterium from enzymes produced in the specimen's digestive system without a young, healthy specimen. These efforts were in vain, and unfortunately, because they couldn't hear the sea emperor, they couldn't hatch it out and, and actually get what they needed in a nice way so uh you know hey ho all right on to our herbivorous friends so we've got the gasopods who of course were our best friends when we were still uh, at our base in the in the safe shallows but gasopod a slow moving life form which fills the environment or the surrounding water rather with poisonous and corrosive compound capable of dissolving even synthetic fibers number one a filtration system multiple gill layers appear to render this creature impervious to the noxious clouds it produces which makes kind of sense hence its weird gas mask face um algae glands the bulbous sac like appendage on the rear end a, a luminescent yellow algae grows inside the sac and produces a poisonous compound abdominal muscles can contract causing the algae gland to emit the noxious compound into the surrounding water large pelvic fins these things obviously uh, capable of powerful movement through the water when moving in small herds which you know we've seen them kind of frolic around and kind of jump around a bit as they're swimming or uh, swimming about and, and spewing their noxious crap all over the place um, gasopods appear to be social in nature and may even use their emissions in their relationship rituals their audible calls are likely signifiers of nearby threats or food sources which you know we hear that enough and they tend to be laughing at us a lot of the time because they're assholes too um so yeah ghost ray so these are the ones that are that, that are all around the membrane tree and make all the eerie noises down in the lost river and stuff like that genetic analysis indicates this specimen is a close cousin of the jelly ray adapted to deep sea conditions unlike the spe that specimen uh, and ugh, unlike that species its body is fully protected by a translucent skin and its large wings are capable of generating considerable thrust so in other words the the creature inside there that looks more like a jelly ray is more the actual creature and then you've got the it, it, it has developed this protective overlayer um to kind of keep itself safe as well uh so highly poisonous flesh docile feeds on plant matter that has settled on the sea floor so yeah they're they're friendly for the most part and at some point we'll go back and we'll scan all the ones all the creatures that are down there that we didn't get to to touch on but again i want to try and disable the warpers and things first because uh otherwise they're go they're just going to get in the way really
Jelly Ray, my little friends, um, shares some evol every, uh, evolutionary traits with the Rabbit Ray, including highly poisonous flesh. This species has adapted to low light environments with a translucent, luminescent body. This may help to light up surrounding area for foraging. Waterway predators identify the organism to others of its kind. Smaller creatures have been seen swimming in the jelly ray's wake to take advantage of the light source for their own ends. And the jelly ray itself will approach light sources, perhaps mistaking them for others of its own species. It's fair enough. And now we've got my little favourite friends here. Herbivorous aquatic life form, the rabbit ray. Rabbit rays appear to live serene and solitary lives with few predators, a natural sense of curiosity and awesomely poisonous flesh. The latter likely enables the former. Ears. Two orange appendages mount, mounted on the head sense vibration in the water, which is why when we swim near them, they all try to run away very, very quickly. Um, undulating wings. Markedly similar method to transportation of transportation to that of earth rays zero genetic resemblance detected suggesting these two species independently developed similar solutions to their environmental circumstances inedible but harmless again it's uh, the kind of fi life finding like a best form um you know there's it's a reason why there are so many like why the majority of mammals are kind of quadrupedal you know, and and stuff like that. They 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 have, um, there are certain kind of most easily found paths, and I would assume you know rays and sharks are some of the oldest, um, kind of least evolved aquatic creatures on the planet. So you know, I'd imagine that that was a fairly simple but highly effective kind of path, and so it doesn't it makes sense that it would be it would occur somewhere else as well. Oops, didn't mean to go to this one. Uh, reef back. Limited data available because their their top shell bit is incredibly hard. It used to be you used to have to potentially get s like scans and samples of them for reinforcing the hull of the cyclops. Which I'm glad they changed that because it didn't make an awful lot of sense to me uh, to one extent or another. But limited data available. The microcosm of life on this creature's shell uh, shell plates. Uh, indicates advanced ages between 100 and 300 years old. Chitinous plating, the creature's armor plating, is thick enough to interfere with the spectroscopic analysis. Unknown pods, unknown purpose, green in color, visually similar to the glands seen on other creatures. So it could be algae focused and could again be why these guys don't seem to eat anything. You know, they support that, that environment on their back the algae and bacteria all go into these little little kind of pods or nodules there and then they potentially generate sustenance for the reef back as a whole again though you would think that that would be at least in part due to some element of photosynthesis or or something like that but they're on the underside of the creature which is odd so it could be temperature based it could be something else entirely but you know it's 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 strange tentacles total length uh, ranges upwards of 25 meters provides low speed propulsion unless you see them spinning around like a crazy person in which case stay away because they're fucking dangerous sociable seen traveling in small pods behavior consistent with low level sentience and then uh, the unknown predators because we've never seen anything that could really chomp down on one of these things successfully considering their armor and then you know additional research required sure I'd love to but you know hard to do and then we've got the sea treader, who are just so cool for various reasons. Um, a vast bipedal life form which roams the uh, the reefs in herds. See, so it's only got two legs, but then its its mouth, its snout, is its third leg. Elongated snout used to siphon up plant material from the sea floor and maintain balance. So these are locomotive, and this is just there to kind of keep it balanced. Um, and also the sea treader's path why it's been picked clean is because their mouth is always there so if there's something there that can be eaten can be picked clean then they'll they'll eat it they'll graze it away analysis suggests adaptation for migratory behavior uh, large herds would be projected to decimate the flora of a single grazed area high calorie diet and then suggestion is that we investigate it but 
you know, and their poop is apparently useful to one extent or another. So, uh, you know, that's something that we uh, will investigate at some point as well. But, you know, these guys are just, these guys are just cool and useful. You know, they're, they're handy. But okay, so scavengers and, whoops, scavengers and parasites. So these amoeboids, apparently, in some of the concept art, these guys used to be like the top end of a jellyfish creature. But they, that didn't make it into the game, and so they didn't want to just lose the assets. So they created, they, they started using the, the top end of the, the creature, the little blue kind of cell-like things that we see around, especially in the, the Lost River and, and parts of the reef, uh, the Grand Reef and stuff like that. Um, they, they've, they've just dotted them around the place as decoration as this kind of like sing, almost like macro-sized single-cell organism. Um... A similar non-sentient organism found attached to land with high levels of fossilized organic matter. It feeds on this matter until it reaches maturity, at which point it divides to create two new genetically identical offspring and, and the cycle continues. So that's why we see so many of them. They, they just slowly move around, feeding off like fossilized matter and, and kind of dead bio uh, biological um, kind of waste of some sort or another. And then after they hit capacity, they just split you know st straight up uh, mitosis i think um from what i recall from my a-level biology you know it's it's really interesting because again it would be a case of when everything else on this planet has died these guys would be the only things left and then again i'm surprised in part that the that these things weren't taken and used more by the precursors because we see a, a couple of these things in cases and things around the the various precursor bases but if these you know the, the karar attack these you know we don't see any of these with the karar on them or anything like that and yet they're still kind of just straightforward simple organisms that are, are just chewing their way through dead matter possibly matter that's been fossilized or killed off by the karar and left there for a long time to petrify in one way or another you know it's it's it'd be interesting to see kind of if they if they actually manage to try anything with those cave crawlers these guys are assholes and they come in two varieties the, the ones with the long spindly legs and these little ones um agile territorial carrion feeder well adapted to both land and sea gas exchange membrane which is the bit around the top here Absorbs essential gases from air or water for basic bodily regulation. Mandibles. This species seeks out corpses' impacts before defending its claim while the corpse is devoured. Now, the thing that stands out to me is there are an awful lot of these guys on the um, the the mountain where the gun is. And I'm like, what, what did they find there that they were able to eat? Because in theory, all the precursors just went and They've, they've disappeared entirely you know they've, they've digitized their brains into their various storage facilities to one extent or another and they're gone but like, if these guys are defending their claim up on that mountain island you know is there something we're missing there is there something up there that, that is substantial enough to keep them around because again seeing them on the floating island you know that's kind of understandable because they are um, you know that you've you've got plant matter, creature matter, you they are the the thing that probably ate away at uh, Bart Torvald's body, uh, which is why we don't find a body so much as even bones up there. So um, you know, that's interesting to see where those cre where these creatures actually are. I mean there are there is an abundance of predators around the 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 mountain um, area, so maybe that would be just why they're hanging out, they're just waiting for their next meal. But hey ho, lava lava, these bastards. Um, a grub like species which appears to lack sense of sight and smell but is able to sense and drain thermal and electric energy in the environment. Underside suction cup, capable of attaching to smooth surfaces and generating high pressure suction. Torso, thick scales protect from extreme temperatures, lacks traditional di digestive system. Attra uh, attracted to energy sources of all kinds, draws energy from its prey to survive, avoid when piloting powered vehicles. See, now this is an interesting thing, because 
they were so so these creatures uh, you know we don't know if they grow into anything we don't know if they potentially pupate and then grow into something else um they are just these little little creatures that come and and have developed a means by which to to kind of sap energy from their environment to keep themselves going which is interesting but at the same time like more information please cuz again this could be a result of the kara plus precursor stuff and and all the rest of it and so these creatures grew from from something like that um, but also it could be something completely different and so it's, it's a bit weird but then we've got the last one here that we've got a scan of for creatures and that's the shuttle bug common scavenger at the base of the food chain mouth parts which are these little bits here uh, small enough to be of no threat to even small organisms this creature is clearly adapted to feed on the waste products of the ecosystem around it so it's probably there just eating off dead dead mat dead plant matter you know uh, creature corpses stuff like that uh, three mandibles, which are the, the big flappy things up here, um, used to orientate themselves when drifting and to filter through detritus on cave floors. And then they've got three little legs. High strength muscles can propel the, uh, the, the life form great distances through the water, as well as ambulating them across the sea floor. Assessment harmless presence may indicate nearby cave systems. So they're just more of an indicator for, for us to see where caves and things are. You know, they're, they're of no real significance to us at all. Then, you know, we've got our Chinese potato plants, which, uh, you know, were bought essentially bought here by uh, the, the Toggle lot. Um, we've got the gel sacks, which, are, which we make aerogel from, which these organic structures grow on cave walls, purple sacks, which arise from the surface contain a low density gel laced with spores. These uh, burst from time to time, floating towards the surface and attaching onto uh, the next rock face they encounter. While the gel sac is edible, its low density renders it as invaluable. Uh, sorry, low density renders it as an invaluable advanced construction material, edible but also aerogel construction appliances applications, which is far more important. Then we got our friendly lantern tree. Which, um, yeah, it doesn't really have any extra information on it other than, yeah, you can eat this. So there you go. But right, we've got the giant cove tree, which is a vast tree encountered in the deep cove, the only one of its kind encountered on the planet. Cove bark, a hardy, fast-growing bark, covers the outside of the tree. Minuscule organisms inhabit the notches uh, in the surface so this is more of a it is, it is a tree but it's more of an, uh, an entire ecosystem rather than just a tree in and of itself um, or rather the focal point of an ecosystem uh, ghost leviathan eggs these branches are wrapped around a number of unhatched eggs the eggs belonging to the to one of the leviathan species found in this biome so again it, it's like this seems to be uh, the focal point possibly because of the eggs but um, it's it's interesting how it all plays together and how this came to pass this tree appears to be an ancient nesting ground the eggs were laid when the tree was young and now the branches grow and protect uh, protect and grow with them as they await the right conditions to hatch now the thing that stands out to me is what are the right conditions to hatch because this is the problem with the sea emperor they need very specific conditions to hatch and we've got to replicate those with the hatching enzyme created uh, from numerous different uh, plants that in theory would either be gathered by the sea emperor um, kind of mother and brought to them or potentially just through um, like having the eggs around with them, it would, and, and the ocean currents, it would, that they would hatch. Like, if you look at the the sea emperor and the way that it's made its little throne in the, the kind of holding facility, the thing that stands out to me is we don't see any other real structures like that. Yeah. And granted, they could be washed away and all the rest of it, depending on, on how long a sea emperor sits over its eggs because the sea emperor that we've we've encountered is a rare specimen that has had to sit and watch over its eggs for a very long time 
but again, it's still a case of uh, where in this area over the, the top of the volcano would they have settled with their eggs to nest so that they could hit the right conditions. And then here we've seen a couple of sea emperor, not sea emperor, uh, ghost leviathan um, juveniles swimming around in the Lost River. Uh, but they're still quite big. So it's like, well, when did they hatch? What conditions were they? Uh, did, did Was this area um, kind of fulfilling for them to allow them to hatch? You know, it's in uh, interesting questions that we'll probably never get answers to. Um, membrane tree. This entity defies neat categorization. It consists of more than one coral species working in tandem to create an insulated microcosm enclosed within a translucent membrane found exclusively growing on basalt rock in the Grand Reefs. The homeostatic conditions within are considerably warmer and more dense with microbial life than the outside environment, and the bright purple fauna inside are likely, uh, will likely die off very quickly if exposed. So you've got the, the base of the tree, which is all coral based, and then they've worked together to create this membrane in which a unique form of, of plant matter, as well as a highly rich microbial ecosystem has kind of sprung from. Like if this is the, the kind of uh, the various elements of, of each kind of taxon, that's that's all working together here that's a lot of different species engaged in the kind of creation and maintaining of this and so like it'd be interesting to get a sample from inside and see what there is but you know i don't think we'll ever get that opportunity considering we we've kind of settled on where we're going and what we're doing with the game uh overall uh thanks to you know we know that we've got some some stuff that coming down the pipe for um, kind of the the rocket to get off the planet and stuff like that. We know that apparently the cute fish is getting a goodbye animation, so that once we've built the rocket, we say goodbye to our cute fish friend and then we leave, which is kind of sad. Um, but we need to get a cute fish, possibly more than one, as many as we possibly can. Um, but I need to find out where their eggs come from as well. But that is so far what we've got in regards to the the lore and story and universe and everything of Subnautica and so that's kind of all very we've got a lot of interesting things we've got a lot of questions that we've we've pro some of which we're probably never going to ah, some of which we're probably never going to get an answer to which is uh, a bit of a shame but uh, you know that's that's kind of the way of things um, and so it's I didn't mean to do that, I wanted to click that one um, and so you know, we, we've, we've got these things, we can keep an eye out for for uh, answers, apparently they're going to be putting in even more voice logs uh, from people including some uh, YouTubers I think it's Neebs Gaming that are, that are putting those in um, so we'll, we'll potentially get some more uh, info and stuff like that, there's apparently been updates or will be updates to one extent or another for um, the the Degassi bases and more PDAs and all that kind of thing as well, which is cool and groovy. Um, but our next port of call after this, now that we're through going through our PDA, it's going to have to be finding those sea crowns because we've got to find those sea crowns so that we can hatch those those Emperor Leviathan eggs, get ourselves cured, kill the gun. And then all we need to do after that is continue to explore. Hopefully having an easier time of exploring as well. Uh, we've got to go get... We've got, where, where is... There we go. We've got to go get Flimsy back from uh, way down there. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, 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 got, we've got that to do. We've got a whole load more creatures to still scan, including all of the Leviathans. Um, as well as, as I said before, we've got... Um, the dead zone to go and explore but I want to do that in creative so we can get down to the bottom more easily than tackling the uh, the fully grown leviathans ourselves 
as much as we will be going on Leviathan hunts, that is something that the I'm I, I don't want to lose time on just kind of ducking down into the the depths of God knows where. But uh, anyway, guys. Otherwise, uh, where should I start? Let me know. Should I should I be? Um, I mean, I think the Sea Crown is probably our best start. But you know, would you like me to go into creative mode, take a break from the survival stuff, and go down into the dead zone first? Uh, maybe do some some Leviathan hunting there because it'd be safer and easier. Mm, maybe. Um, or would you like to just see me crack on with you know after we've got the the Sea Crowns and sorted out the hatching enzymes then we just go straight on to exploring for the other precursor caches more scan data so that we can learn more stuff and and stuff like that turning the gun off you know getting cured you know let me know now i i'm i'm kind of happy to go for whichever option really so you know whichever turns out to be uh most popular uh i'll go for so uh, thank you very much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, then please drop us a like, share this video, and subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care.